first episode of hyperglycemia. And it's a good little graph to look at. So on the left, these kids were not given any food, any IV glucose, uh, and you'll see that they had their first episode pretty quickly, at like one or two hours. The kids who were given food, their mean onset of hypoglycemia was later, but you'll also notice that there are all of these outliers. So there's one up there at 18 hours, his first episode. So giving food can actually delay them having hypoglycemia. So keep that in mind. If you've treated them in any way, or if the family has treated them with food, and they come in and you check their glucose and they're totally normal, beware, because they can do this as soon as you send them home. Uh, you'll notice kind of, so food and IV glucose, the mean is again later in the day. It's around 10 hours, but there's still some outliers. So these kids we actually admit for 24 hours without even thinking about it, even if they don't have any hypoglycemia, because they can do all of these things. And when they did this study, and it's been talked about, should we fast these kids for 12 hours in the emergency department and then try and send them home? And that just sounds mean and crazy. So nobody does that. We admit the kids for 24 hours. Most people don't argue that and think it's a good idea. So, you do, these you might want to consider giving trifle to these kids because some of these are long acting, especially if they have multiple pills in. Because if you don't let them absorb it, you don't have to deal with the consequences, which is nice. You might want to consider hold out irrigation if it's a big enough ingestion, which is essentially an NG tube with Golightly because no one can drink it that fast, not even adults, so expecting a little kid to drink it repeatedly is just not gonna happen. Um, octreotide should be considered in these cases <clears throat> for persistent hypoglycemia. This may or may not end up being something we give in the emergency room. I would argue if you have one episode, maybe try your glucose, but if you have two, definitely just give the octreotide before you send the kid upstairs. And then sulfonylureas are not dialyzable, they're very highly protein bound. So out of curiosity, how long should we wait until we discharge these kids after the last dose of octreotide? There's really no consensus, unfortunately, but at least a few hours is what the last study said. Uh, okay, in the last case, I promise. So 22-month-old, previously healthy and active toddler from Mississippi had two vomiting episodes that the parents believed were due to an intestinal virus, <coughs> as they usually are. Later that day, the child was pale, weak, and continued to vomit resulting in an admission to the emergency department. At the hospital, the child was diagnosed with dehydration and for some reason they got an x-ray. And they see this. Does anybody know what this is? What is the magnets. The magnets, exactly. Which I do actually have for you to play with also. Please don't eat these. <laughs> <laughs> I can split them into two. But these are these little dime, neodymium magnets that people are using as little office toys and stress relievers and things like that. Maybe put them back together at the end of there. <laughs> so these are buckyballs. They were very hard to find when I bought them a few years ago. For this reason, there have been many ingestions in little kids and it causes a lot of problems. They're super strong. Try and pull them apart, they come right back together. You can build little things with them. They are a lot of fun to play with. Fortunately, kids think so too. In fact, there have even been cases of adolescents using them as tongue rings, fake tongue rings, and swallowing them. Because they're strong enough to hold on the other on either side of the tongue. <laughs> so the problem with these, if you swallow more than one, is they can actually hold together because they're so strong and attach on opposite sides of the valve, which is bad because they can then work their way through the valve, which is what we're looking at here. So these are totally different parts of the valve here, <laughs> but then they pull them nicely together right up into the stomach. So the second x-ray appeared to show some movement of the magnets, so some people will get repeated x-rays and watch to see if the magnets will move. Uh, he was observed in the hospital, which is a good thing to do. Then they didn't see any more movement, and they went back and they decided to do surgery on him. And unfortunately during the surgery they did notice a valve perforation for this reason, it had pulled the valve together. So that was found and repaired. Three days later he developed a fever, they had to take him back to surgery, another valve perforation was found and he had some bowel surgery removed. Um, so you'll notice these, these are just some pictures of what these can do. I mean, this form is a circle, which could all be together. It's a little hard, to, it's impossible to say, unfortunately, from an x-ray. Is that all in one little piece of bowel, or is that in 12 pieces of bowel? We're not gonna go through this, but 
This is the guideline, um, I'm forgetting the acronym now, but a bunch of GI specialists and pediatric surgeons got together and developed some guidelines on how do we deal with this brand new problem that we have because of these strong little magnets that are fun to even play with. Really, the, the uh, nitty gritty of it is, if magnets are in the stomach, you're gonna call GI. If they're beyond the stomach, you're gonna call pediatric surgery. <coughs> if there's more than one magnet, do the above and then admit them, and you're done dealing with that patient. If there's a single magnet, you might actually consider them sending out, sending them out. If you could really guarantee that there's only one in there, and I would get probably two views at least of the app of it to make sure there's not one hiding behind. But you have to give the parents some really strict return precautions, and you also have to tell them no magnetic objects anywhere near your child until we get this to come out. <laughs> Avoid clothes with any metal buttons or any belts. And again, it's and no metal objects. So no no magnetic, no metal objects. No buttons on your clothes and no belts. It's kind of a lot to tell a parent, I think. <laughs> but a good thing to remember, because that can then pull out to the outside and pull a hole through the wall that way. So in 2009, the Poison Center issued a ban on the sale, not the Poison Center, sorry, a government agency issued a ban on these. Um, the manufacturers were not very happy about this. They put this nice little warning on there. Uh, it does say four delts only. <clears throat> And they did order a recall, but as I understand, not too many of them actually came back. So we're just going to go over some key points really quickly, and then we'll do some questions. So this is a good thing to talk about in clinic. Do you have these in your house? And if you do, you can continue to use them. They're great and, and very convenient. But tell parents, you have to keep these away from the kids. They're very toxic. They can cause a lot of problems. <coughs> if you see them, irrigate them immediately before you've really done anything else. Take their clothes off. Make sure you irrigate the eyes if they have anything in there um, and really wash them off well, not with baby wipes. <clears throat> Watch for signs of respiratory distress. And you might want to do a six to eight hour observation period because they might get uh, attended. They might get sleepy and they might require incubation or admission. Again, if it's a really small uh, exposure, nowhere near the mouth, nothing in the eyes, you've fluorescein stain them, they look great, you probably don't have to do a six to eight hour observation period. Because like that study said, 63% of these kids will have no symptoms at all. So for hydrocarbons, again we want to decontaminate. Uh, there are many different types, so really utilize your poison center. Watch for pulmonary symptoms, do your hydrocarbon precautions. Uh, but Called poison center, is what I would say. Camper specifically, you might want to consider charcoal if it's these little um, these little blocks that look like candy that would be fun to eat, because they could still be absorbing, and you really like to stop that because this is very systemically toxic. <clears throat> you can use benzodiazepines for seizure. In most cases, toxicology-related seizures you should treat with benzodiazepines and not other seizure medications because they will not be effective. And then at least a four-hour observation period, so four to six. Hydrocarbon precautions, I think that's a good way to talk about it. Uh, Sulfonylureas, so that's your glyphoside and glyburide. Those are your drugs that release insulin. So things like metformin do not release insulin. So that's not as serious. So charcoal with recent, especially if multiple or extended release pills are uh, involved. Prophylactic administration of food, again, can cause a delayed first incidence of hypoglycemia. So don't fast them or starve them, but do keep that in mind, that if they had anything, you may not see it and you should just admit them anyway. <laughs> so severe clinical effects such as seizures and even death have resulted when this has not been uh, realized or the child has been home sleeping when the first episode of hypoglycemia attacks. So observe them for 24 hours. Don't swallow magnets in general. <laughs> Encourage your children not to swallow magnets as well. Um, if there are multiple magnets present, you don't send them home. You, you just admit these kids and they get odds, or GI goes in and grabs them, or you do serial abdominal x-rays to see if they're actually passing, and if they're not, then surgery probably needs to go in after them. So call GI is still in the esophagus or stomach, and they should admit, be admitted to pediatric surgery if it's beyond the, the stomach. These are our one pill can kill that we always talk about with kids. We're not going to go into it in depth, but you can camphors on here. Notice just five mLs of um, camphorated oil can cause death in a small child. Um, benzocaine is something we actually use, and they used to use often with uh, teething gels. 
we were seeing kids with seizures, um, methemoglobinemia, because it can cause that. So I don't even think that's available on the market anymore, as far as I'm aware. And then you'll see some cardiac drugs. Cardiac drugs are always iffy in small children. And let's see. And then, let's get here. So methyl salicylate, that is that oil of wintergreen that smells very strong. Really small amounts of that, less than five mLs, can actually kill a kid. And then we're seeing a lot of methadone, a lot of oxycodone, a lot of, um, we have a lot of problems with that. Now if people abusing that and little kids can get their hands on things that might be left behind or placed somewhere where a parent is not paying attention. So just to wrap up, call the poison center. This is the provider line. So if you are calling with a clinical case, you can call this number. It gets you to your closest poison center. You can also call the other line, the 222. I'm forgetting the last four digits now that we give to parents. But there is a second number that's a provider number. Um, you want to decontaminate because if, if you get it, it does not get absorbed, you do not have to deal with the consequences, and that is preferable. Always consider toxic exposures in sick kids, even if you think it's sepsis, like we just talked about, or metabolic or cardiac. At least think about it because sometimes they're sneaky and they've gotten into something, or somebody's given them something, unfortunately. And say, want to have any questions? We're, we're definitely seeing um, tobacco intoxications in little kids, unfortunately, because they smell good, they're colorful. I kind of want to put them in my mouth, I get that. So yeah, we're definitely seeing tobacco uh, ingestions. And tachycardia and hypertension and things like that. So batteries, you know those little flat batteries? Uh -huh. So, you know, we I'd seen a number of kids come through with, uh, with that, and nobody seemed to jump up and down about it, but the other day the attending came through and they put a battery, one of those little flat batteries, in a hot dog, and they let it sit for four hours. Yeah. And then they showed us the hot dog, and the hot dog was just demolished. If it's a, yeah, if it's a battery, even if it's in the stomach, it should be taken out. Because the problem, for that reason, is that if you put two nice pieces of warm, wet flesh on either side of that battery, it completes that circuit, and the battery works. So you can, the same thing with the magnets, but it pulls it together, and you're actually going to, you might have valve perforation. So some people will take them out, even if they're in the stomach and small, and they think they're going to pass because they can cause trouble. I'm thinking of like the nigra scenario where you don't know they ingested the magnets, and, uh -huh. but they have all this symptomology, and then you send them for an MRI. I mean, that kind of stuff, like the Oh, that seems like that would yeah, realistically happen. I haven't right? heard of that happening, but it's 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 a possibility. Yeah. Yeah. That's like super scary. Yeah. Yeah. They're pretty small. I'm trying. I don't know how much they would move. Hopefully, not. it'll it would warm up for sure. Could be a problem. Any other questions? Nope. Thanks, guys. Thank you.